All right, and I'll pass it over to Lewis to walk us through demos. Okay, perfect. So yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, who would like to start with demos first? Um, sorry, I don't remember which order, but either way, I can start with the, the feature demo for our issue. Um, okay, you get the screen up. Okay. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yeah, we can okay. see your screen. Great. So um, our issue this week was to um, make sure that, or add some checks to the new item input to make sure that users can't add um, either an empty item or you know, an item with an empty name or um, an item that's already on their list after we've normalized the punctuation and like capitalization of the of the input. So I'm um, logged in here and the dinner list that we have, all kinds of things on here <laughs> from testing. Um, so the first thing you could try is just entering a you know an empty item and it should give you an error message that says please enter an item name. Um and then we also so we had already, I think, in a previous issue dealt with the capitalization of the um of the input. Um so we use that here and also added, um, as I mentioned, the checks for the punctuation and spaces and stuff. So if you tried to, so for example, we have apple pie with some interesting capitalization there. And if we just add, tried to add apple pie to just, just all lowercase, um, it'll say this item already exists in the list. So it compares the two and says they're the same. Um, and then also, if you were to add some punctuation or something to an item that's already on the list, say Gruyere, and you added like a period and a space or something, um, and then you try to add it, it will also say this item already exists in the list. Um, but you can add different levels of specificity. So there's you know, clam chowder, but also a New England clam chowder or apples, but also green apples. Um, so those things do not, you know, trigger the error message. I think that's it for our demo. Let me stop sharing. Um, I'll go ahead and share my side. Okay, so you should be able to see our code. Um, we made changes to two files. Um, it was the app.jsx and manage list. And for app.jsx, um, it was pretty simple. All we did was include our data as a prop for our manage list uh, view. And moving over to manage list, we have our data passed in at the top. And as a recap, um, the form or the shape that our items take in the list is an object and they all have um, a property called item name. So when we created a new variable called current list, we took that data and we mapped out the item names um, to a, uh, an array. And so we normalized each of these item names uh, using the built-in to lowercase method. And then we use regex to remove uh, special characters, punctuation, spaces. And so this particular array is what we'll be using to compare new item names to later on. Um, 
in the handle item submit function, this is where we took the, where is it? Here it is. Um, we took the user input and created a new variable for the item name that's normalized in the same way as um, above. So we have our regex and we have our two lowercase in both instances. That way, um, everything is being normalized the same way so that you can compare it directly. And so we then added a couple pieces of logic. Um, first piece was that if there is no uh, text in the input when the user tries to submit, then they get an alert and the function stops. And our other piece is the current list array that's being used to compare to see if it includes that normalized version of the new item name. Um, and if it already exists in there, then uh, we get an alert as well. And otherwise, if both of these conditions pass, so it's not empty and the item doesn't already exist, then the function continues on and um, it'll try and add the item into the database. So it felt pretty straightforward this week. Um, any questions about the code? I do realize that actually that I did some digging into regex and we probably could have simplified this a little more, but you know, we're not, we're not pros at this. <laughs> I was gonna actually ask about the regex because I, I know a lot of developers are intimidated by it. Um, and I'm just curious, like what was your experience with it? Have, have you used regex before? Uh, and how were you able to like figure out what you needed to, to do here? I'm just gonna speak for myself. Um, Emily might have had a different experience. Uh, I've had a little bit of regex experience in that like I have Googled and looked things up on Stack Overflow. Uh, to help me out. And this is definitely um, one of the scenarios where we got like the base um, concept from Stack Overflow. And then we added um, a couple little extra pieces to fit our AC. Yeah, that's totally valid. I think most people <laughs> have a similar relationship to regex. Um, it is really powerful and like, you know, definitely something um, worth like familiarizing yourself with a little bit. But I will say for myself, at least every time I use regex, I have to Google how to use it. But understanding like broad picture, how it works can like help make it easier when you're Googling how to use it or like using, there's like some some good tools for um, helping you to check your regex. I don't know, Lewis, if you are a pro at regex or what your relationship is like. I mean, I can study it for a day and then I'll be great at it for like the next three days and then I'll forget everything and then I have to do it again. And study and then forget. It's hard to remember because I don't use it that often. So, yeah, same. <laughs> but yeah, nice job using regex, y'all. Cool. Yeah, does everyone else have any other questions? All right. Nice job. Um. So next will be Shane and Davina. Sure. Yeah, I'll hop into the demo. This one was a little bit tricky. So this is my best um my best idea to show as a demo. Because essentially, one second, our let's see our issue. Do, 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 go here. Um our issue was to actually start sort of manipulating some of those files in our database. Um and so essentially I, I set up a little test crackers object. And I was going to show us what it looks like in Firebase before and after interacting with it um, to show off our acceptance criteria. It's one of these. Give me just a moment here. Apples, yogurt, pickles, test crackers. Here we go. Um, so the long and short of our AC is that when we click an item, aka buying an item, we should have some logic in place that changes the date next purchased to coincide with um, that sort of different actual purchase date compared to the expected purchase date. Um, so I'll show you that real quick. So I was just adding this item directly to Firebase. I didn't do this three days ago, so I think this will work, but not positive. 
Um, but yeah, long story short is um, added the item, you know, March 7th, so to speak. The I, I sort of set it up so, you know, that next day it's actually bought. And then the date next purchased was like that 30 day expectation to buy it again. So now that it's March 10th, if we buy it again and it's only two days later, we should see this date next purchase of April 7th move up closer, it, uh, essentially. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many days it'll move up, but we should see that date next purchase change. Um, so I'll do that now. I've got <clears throat> got it um, up, up on the branch, and then I'm just going to click test crackers as if I'm buying it. Oh, whoopsie. See here, do, 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 do. Oh, this is my mistake. So in dateless purchase, this actually needs to be an array. And then I'll add the date itself. Let's see here. Let's see here, remove that. Do, do, do. And now I need to add within this an object. For the Real quick, I just want to throw in that the user wouldn't have this issue. Like when they click an item, it'll automatically be an array. Right. Let's see here. And then March 8th. So now, now that I've fixed that, the date last purchase should be sort of like an array of all the days it's been purchased. Now that it's an array with the timestamp object, I should be able to click it without that error. So I'll try that. So I'll, essentially, I'll just unclick. I'm going to reload real quick and then just click it. Oh, it's still doing it. Um, let's see here. What what was another one, another good one to test? Of, you know, would it be like... um. Gosh, tuna fish, I think was another one we were working on. I think tiramisu or... was a good one. Oh, sure. Let me pull that up. Here we go. Tiramisu. Let's see, date last purchased. So we've got the current date next purchase for tiramisu as March 24th. And we just bought it essentially like today, sort of a thing, just, just this morning. So let's see. If we can do, just try it on this one. You might so, want to um remove that last date last purchase before, because it's not going to... Not going to update it? Yeah. Sure. I'm going to remove that March 10th date. And now as I click, it should add another March 10th, so to speak. And this is Tiramisu. Click Arena. All right, so I clicked it. And now I'm looking at this. New March 10th. Oh, I didn't take note of what it was, but I, I believe that moved forward. I'm, I, I didn't pay close attention. I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so as we add that March 10th, that original estimate of um, probably three weeks before we buy it again moved forward or or maybe it was a month and then it moved forward. I can I can try to kind of run through this again with um, another example, too. This is this has not been an ideal demo. <laughs> it works. It's hard to demo because you have to play around with dates. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. We also did cheesecake, right? There we go. I'm gonna try it with cheesecake. Um. So because it's March eighth, this should actually just move it up. Date next purchase. So it should. And we'll look at the logic of the actual thing too. So let me find cheesecake here real quick, and I'm gonna say. We're purchasing cheesecake. Right now it says March 11th at 9 a.m. Click cheesecake. March 13th at 9.16 a.m. is now the new date. And you can see that date last purchase added to that array. Um, and that is essentially the demo I was hoping to do originally. Okay. I, uh, before you start, oh, I have yeah. a quick question, actually. Mm -hmm. it, does it work if you want to check? the uh, item two like does it go back to its original state so right now we had discussed having this be like a future edge case testing so when you uncheck it it'll remove the last um the last date purchased it'll reset it back to what the previous one was um it doesn't currently update the next purchase date um so like if he unchecks that right now it's going to go back to March 8th, it's going to remove that March 10th purchase, but it's not going to update that March 13th. We discussed doing that in like a future issue, um, refactoring to test for that edge case. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Sorry, continue. Oh, there you go. Good. That was a good question. Uh, all right. So let me share my screen. Okay. So um, we 
updated also only two files. Um, I'll start with the dates one because it's a lot more straightforward. Um, so in the dates.js, we just created a function um, that's going to be imported into Firebase. This function takes two dates, two JavaScript date objects, and then converts them to milliseconds and then um, returns the number of days in between those two dates. Um, so the way that it does that, we first convert those date objects to um, time in milliseconds, and then we get the um, the time that's passed between them in milliseconds by subtracting um, the first time from the second time. So that's the number of milliseconds that have passed between the two dates. And then we, of course, divide by one day in milliseconds, which had already been put in to the, like, the code for us when that had a uh, future date was already in there. Um, so we just use that same one day in milliseconds to get um, the number of days. And then um, we return the number of days between those two dates. And we are rounding to the second decimal place on that. And then in Firebase, so this gets a little bit complicated and wonky and there's a lot of calculations for calculations going on here. So if you have any questions like interrupt me. I'll try to be very clear about the process that it walks through, but uh, we imported calculate estimate here. Um, so you might have noticed that you might need to do like a NPM install when you pull from the main to get this in there. Um, I think it was supposed to be in there already, but it wasn't. So we had to import it. And let's see here. So originally we did all of our logic in this update item function. Uh, Shane can attest to the fact that it was like 50 lines of code long um, by the time we were done with this. So we ended up moving that into a helper function. Um, I'll go over that part later. Um, so we moved the logic into a helper function so that we could just really focus on the, like the update item portion of it in this particular function. So um, the main thing that we added was uh, we call our helper function here. Um, we use object destructuring to access these two properties, which we pass into the update doc function. Um, we also moved the the like is checked. Um, previously, it had been like if is checked. Um, here we had done like a ternary operator, I think, where it was like um, is checked. New date is the date last purchased. Um, else null or something like that. And then total purchases was like the same thing. Like if it's checked, increment. If it's not, um, increment by negative one. We changed the um, the shape of date last purchased to an array. So um, that's what you see going on here. So update doc, we use the spread operator on the previous array and then add the new date. So that's gonna be like the most recent date last purchased. And then these are the uh, previous date last purchased. Um, we also updated the add item so that it's just, it's going to be a, an array when the user adds, um, adds that new item and passes in a new date. And that way we always have like an estimate, like a previous estimate. So um, the calculate estimate function takes the previous estimate and without like a date last purchase, we previously had null here without a date last purchase, it's like that calculate doesn't work. So we passed in the new date and that's gonna act as like the first date last purchased to get that um, to get that estimate. And then, yeah, so that's what happen what's happening here. So then I'm gonna walk you through like what we did to get our new estimate. So we passed in the list reference to the, um, that's essentially this, the item that we want to update. And so um, here we're just making a get request to get the item. And then here, this is going to reference the items date last purchased array. So that's the entire array of dates last purchased. Um, and then here we're retrieving just the most recent date last purchased um, because Firebase converts dates to like timestamps. Um, we call the two date method on this to get the um, time in seconds I think it's like time in seconds and like time in nanoseconds are the timestamps. This just reverts it back to a JavaScript date right here. Um, so that's going to be the very last date in that array. And then here, 
um, because calculate estimate, this function that we're importing here, takes um, three parameters. It takes the previous estimate. Um, so like when the user adds an item, they select soon, not soon, kind of soon. It's like seven, 14, and 30 days, I think. So that's going to be the previous estimate. So like when they add the item, the new date gets added in as like the date last purchased. Um, and then the 7, 14, or 30 gets passed in to select the future date there. I'm sorry if this is at all confusing. So like here, um, it's calculating the difference between these two when they first add the item. So um, that's going to be 7, 14, or 30, depending on their choice. So that's going to be the previous estimate. If they have purchased the item before, it's just going to be the difference between the date last purchased and like what the date next purchase currently is. And then, so that's going to be the previous estimate right here. And then days since previous purchase, just the number of days that have passed between today and the last time they purchased it. And we're calling that get days between dates right here. And then those three things get passed in to this calculate estimate function. Um, and so we're returning our new estimate and passing that in here to get... Um, and we're also using the get future date on our new estimate to get the um, date next purchased. That was a lot. So if you have questions, I would be confused myself. So. Um, only thing I would I would want to add um, is that for the calculate estimate for the first purchase, it kind of skips all of the logic of figuring out the weighting. And it just returns the difference between the last purchase and today um, that just uses that for the first, like the, the next one. Uh, but everything above that, it goes through this sort of like little carnival of, of uh, returning a different number than the estimate itself. Yeah, this is, um. so we imported calculate estimate. So we didn't write this function, but um, it, if the number of total purchases is less than two, it just returns the number of days that have gone by since the last purchase. Um, but otherwise it does a calculation. It is a weighted calculation. So like if you have only say three purchases, it's gonna like weigh in such that it's like, okay, you have two previous purchases and that's why it's 14 days here, but it's been seven days since um, you last purchased it. So it's gonna probably find somewhere in the middle, but if it's been something like if you have 30 purchases and your previous estimate was like 30 days and just this one time you purchased it like two days later, it's going to weigh those 30 purchases more heavily than the like one purchase where you did something different. Um, so that's why it takes total purchases in as well to like give that weight to um, wherever the most purchases are. I like that you're showing us this function that you imported and talking us through that logic as well, because it's really easy to just like some kind of magic happens and we're just going <laughs> to pull it in. Um, so it's good to actually understand what's happening. Yeah. yeah, great, great job with this. I know it's a complicated issue. <laughs> kind of fun though. Yeah. <clears throat> Does anyone have any other any questions they want to bring up? You like working with dates now? I wouldn't say I like it, but I feel slightly more comfortable with it. I'll put it that way, where it's like, <laughs> no, I'm just really happy that there are built-in methods to help convert things. Because if I had to do the anything with milliseconds to dates and vice versa manually each time, it would it'd be kind of upsetting, I think. Yeah. Yeah, is there not a way, it seems like that would be, I guess I would have assumed there was like some built-in JavaScript functionality to get the number of days between two dates, but it's not, it seems like you have to, that's what, they have to, you have to create a separate function for that. Yeah, there's no, there's no built-in function. People use libraries mostly. There's like moment mm -hmm. and date functions that have those tools. So you don't have to write them yourself, but since we're not importing mm -hmm. them, you can just build them into the app. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, cool. Yeah, great, great job this week. Um, so I think next we're gonna be doing the learning modules. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take over. Um, so the past two weeks, the learning modules we did, there was one about LinkedIn profiles, and then there was one about navigating your finances. Um, was there one that y'all wanted to start, like one of those topics that y'all wanted to start talking about um, over the other? If not, we can just go sequentially. No strong preference? Okay, then we can start with LinkedIn. Um, how do y'all feel? We've talked about this, I think, in one of my office hours. So I think a lot of us feel a similar level of like apprehension about LinkedIn. Um, do how do you all, have you had a chance to start looking at your LinkedIn profiles and start incorporating some of the advice um, yet? Or what are your thoughts about LinkedIn? Just kind of open ended. I got a question about something that they talked about um, yeah. with the LinkedIn profile. Um, so something that they mentioned was like putting in like your like title description, like a list of technologies and stuff that you are um, proficient in. And I was just curious, like how important it is to do something like that, because I've also noticed that anyone who's currently like most people who are currently a professional software engineer don't have that in their description whatsoever. So I'm like, is it, is that kind of like maybe a like a flag to recruiters or anything like that? How would you? Yeah, would you that's a good question. Um, a lot, so a lot of stuff with LinkedIn is gonna come down to like personal opinion. So I'll ca caveat this by saying that because like different recruiters are probably gonna have different opinions. I think from what I understand, it is helpful uh, if you're trying to find your first job to put some of those keywords in just because of the way the search algorithm on LinkedIn works. If if someone's looking for like a React developer and you have React in your headline, I think you're going to come up higher on their list of results. So it's helpful. Um, I think it, I think your observation about like active working software engineers is probably also accurate um, in that like once you have it's, it's like this vicious cycle of like, once you already have a job, it's easier to get a job. So you don't need to worry so much about the algorithm because like you already have a job working um, as a software engineer. But if you're thinking about, which I think it is a helpful perspective to have with LinkedIn, how to like work the algorithm to your advantage, how to like make yourself show up in more search results. Um, I think it is helpful advice. Um, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but like I did that when I was job hunting originally. I also don't currently have a list of technologies in my headline. So like, I I, I agree with both points <laughs> basically. Um, because also like when you think about LinkedIn headline, you know, you can list your technologies in your profile somewhere, um, but your headline actually shows up if someone's scrolling through their feed and you've commented on something or you've shared something, your headline shows up there too. So you know, if a recruiter is just browsing through LinkedIn or maybe someone like a hiring manager is browsing and they and you show up um, on their list, they can see in your headline that you have one of the technologies that they're looking for. Um, that's my personal opinion. I don't know if anyone else has any experience or any thoughts or you've heard any advice um, on that topic. It's like three different people and get different answers every time. So that just yeah. kind of makes sense. That there's like the two different perspectives. I, I actually notice it too with um, people who don't have a job currently, like people who have been laid off, they, if they have to change their headline. They'll change it to the, the technologies or terms that they use. Just because in search results, the only thing people see are your name and title, which is unfortunate. <laughs> so it's just like, it's like um, a first impression type thing. When people are looking for people in a search result. So trying to make that as attractive as possible. Um, sometimes people would put tools like that. So I've seen it with the, with not just their first job, but people who are laid off or are looking for another job would, would switch to it. But current employees probably don't have that in their title. Yeah, that's helpful. But yeah, it's not just, it doesn't necessarily sig signify a lack of professional experience. It just kind of signifies you're looking for a job. Um, so I would recommend it, but yeah, like Davina, like you said, a lot of this, I think it's good to ask lots of people <laughs> and just kind of try and 
form your opinion based on like what makes sense to you. So that's our opinions. <laughs> Do <laughs> okay. with that what you will. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else have any questions about LinkedIn? Or thoughts or comments? Yeah, I would, I would say um, I, I still, I definitely use LinkedIn, but I don't like it. I really like want to stay off of it in general for my own mental health, it seems like. Um, but all this to say, I try to get a good sense of who might be hiring. And then as soon as I can, I leave LinkedIn and I do anything else other than interact with them on LinkedIn sort of a thing. Um, that's maybe a good like way to interact with it if you're getting tired of it is just use it as like an information gathering source. But the actual like job applying through LinkedIn, I haven't had that much uh, ex like uh, success with so far, put it that way. From what I've heard, like LinkedIn, like applying on LinkedIn for jobs is maybe not the best path if you can like find the original job posting is better. But I like I think it, I've had a lot of like helpful interactions through LinkedIn where I, like reach out for um, like, you know, like outreach to talk to people and like gotten good advice from people in the field. So. Yeah, it's definitely I think we all I think most people uh it's not their favorite social media platform <laughs> um but it, it can be a helpful tool so knowing how to like utilize it as a tool and then also just like not get sucked into the weird vibes of linkedin <laughs> so like shane said like you know be like focused in how you're using it and then you know if it's feeling too much step away i think that's that's solid advice um, but yeah, it's, it is helpful for connecting with people. If there's a company you want to work at and like you can find someone who's willing to talk to you, like those LinkedIn applies, I, I do know some people who've gotten jobs that way, but I, it does seem kind of like maybe not the most effective way of applying for a job. Um, but using LinkedIn to make an actual connection to a person, I think that is very valuable, like ha finding some kind of person um, who can maybe help flag your application out of all of the applications that are coming in, using it to make those human connections, I think is uh, really useful. There's also, um, I would encourage you all to definitely connect with each other on LinkedIn if you haven't already. Also reach out, like connect with um, mentors if you haven't already. Um, I know like, one thing I definitely recommend you all do is to give each other um, recommendations on LinkedIn um, so that, you know, you all are excellent, um, like, witnesses to each other's abilities as software engineers, and you can speak to some of your strengths and everything. So definitely don't feel like you need to do it right now um, while you're working on everything else. But definitely, um, you know, by the time we wrap up, um, I would encourage you to spend a little bit of time doing that for one another. Um, and there's also a LinkedIn, um, like a Collab Lab LinkedIn group that I can send you all um, an invitation to. I, I think I've invited some of you. If I've, if you've connected to me, I've sent you an invitation. Um, but that's a good way to also just connect to the broader TCL community, um, which can be helpful. One, if someone works at a company you're interested in, you already have, you know, something in common that you're part of this community. Um, and two, you can also look at other people's profiles for some inspiration of like, how do I describe my experience at the Collab Lab? Um, there's a whole bunch of people who have done that and you can kind of, you know, like see how they're describing it and, and maybe get some ideas um, too. Yeah. Any other takeaways from this learning module, questions, things you wanted to like get opinions about? I feel like there was an interesting piece of like a recommendation of having TCL as I can't remember if it was like self-employed or something like that um, to put in your experiences. I just felt that that was an interesting category to put it under. Yeah. Um, because it it's like very much a, a educational experience and not so much self-employment 
Yeah, I think I've described it on my LinkedIn as an apprenticeship that felt like the most accurate category to me. Um, it is kind of a weird, it, it's, it is kind of hard to like categorize into like one of the LinkedIn um, categories, but yeah, Shane also has it as an apprenticeship. To me, that feels like something that is inherently like a learning opportunity, but it does, I, I think it is, it's kind of like a hybrid between a learning experience and professional experience because you're working in a format that is very much like what you'll be working as um, in a in a you know paid job. Um, but yeah, I think something I would definitely recommend is if something feels uh, disingenuous to you, that's fine. Do, 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 don't feel like you're like misrepresenting yourself on your LinkedIn. Do what feels accurate because that's how you're marketing yourself basically that's how you're presenting yourself to the world so um yeah do what makes sense maybe look at how other people are describing it and see if someone if that resonates more with you um but yeah I also didn't necessarily I wasn't comfortable describing it as self-employment either so I didn't so I think that's totally fair any other thoughts Let's go ahead and move on then to um, navigating finances through career change, I think it was called. I will definitely caveat this and say that I am not a financial expert, so I'm just here to moderate conversation. Don't take my financial advice uh, as the truth by any means. But um, what did, did, did y'all have any thoughts about this learning module? Um, I mean, I thought that it was really helpful. Like at first when I saw that it was a learning module, <clears throat> I was like, that's kind of a weird thing to throw in here. But watching it, I was kind of like, okay, this makes sense. I do see how someone could, you know, go through a career change, suddenly start making a lot of money and then like not utilize that money to their best advantage if they don't like have a plan of how they're going to use it. So I thought it was pretty helpful. Like I did kind of already have a plan for what I would do if I did suddenly like start making more money through a tech role but it was helpful to have something like, break down like these are things you should be thinking about when you make that transition yeah for sure it is definitely very different than all of our other learning modules um but like personally i can say when i transitioned into tech my first job i was i doubled my salary with my first job in tech and then like within a couple of years i almost tripled my salary from my pre-tech career so like that's great. And I think that's definitely a, one reason people go into tech is for more financial stability. But it is, um, I, I totally agree, Davina, with what you're saying, that if you don't have a plan, uh, it can be easy to just spend all your money and like not really use it to your advantage and like kind of just not actually feel the benefits of, of having a more financially secure um, position. So it's great that you already have had a plan. Um, so I'm happy to hear that because I think that the vast majority of people do not. <laughs> They're just like more money is good, which you know, if you if you're smart about it, it can't be. <laughs> has anyone else? Oh, like you don't have to answer this. I know like money can be like a, a personal topic, but has anyone else put any thought into um, financial planning? Like, does anyone feel pretty comfortable? I, I would not say that I feel super comfortable as like in my financial literacy, but does anyone have like resources that you use for learning more about um, financial literacy? I don't, but I should find some, I'll put it that way. Cause it's, yeah, I'm, um, it's like for my personal finances, it's almost like things are okay, but I definitely don't know what the heck I'm doing or what, where I'm going next sort of a thing. So I definitely need to look more into it personally. Yeah. I think I, my mom sends me financial like articles. That's like how she expresses love, I guess. And <laughs> I need to do a better job of reading them. <laughs> um, yeah, I know this isn't necessarily one tool that I know a lot of people um, at TCL and like a lot of people in general find useful for budgeting is called um, You Need a Budget, um, YNAB which is not for everyone. It's it's a little bit, it, it's a good 
system, I guess. Um, but they also have some financial like resources on YouTube and articles and stuff. So um, that's one I can send y'all to look into if it works for you. But yeah. I feel like there's always like that that great piece of advice, which is to spend less than you make. Um, and I don't know, I feel like I've, I've got all these like little bits and pieces from all these different sources, but feeling like relatively comfortable with my plan, at least I'm just waiting for the money to come in. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, looking forward to like retirement and making sure that like that piece is set, knowing that there's a lot of people out there who don't really have retirement plans as well. And that's kind of scary to me. Yeah, for sure. I think if there's one piece of advice, I definitely agree. Like spend less than you make is really good advice. And the great news, if you, if, if your tech job is going to be like a, a salary boost for you, you are already getting by on less than you could potentially be making. So like try not to let lifestyle creep um, be too much of an enticing thing, you know, where you're like, oh, I can afford this now. I'm just going to like buy super expensive, like coffees or like start like redo my entire wardrobe, like try and be thoughtful about where you're spending money, um, I think is, um, is really solid advice. Um, oh, Lewis says he uses a budgeting tool called Monarch. So that might be another one to look into. Did you want to talk about that, Lewis? Well, it's very close to the the same thing. I just always forget the YNAB thing because I can never remember the acronym. So. Yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. It, it is a useful tool. Yeah. Having a budget is is good advice. I feel like that's one of those things where it's like, it's like flossing where you're like, I know it's good for me, but it's also, <laughs> 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 yeah. I'll yeah. say too, um, another thing that I don't remember if this was um, touched on in the learning module, but another really good thing you can do um, as you're job hunting, um, once you get your offer, negotiate your offer. Um, like, you know, that's a really helpful way of like further getting a little bit more money. Like that's that's one of the times you have the most leverage. Um, once you're already in a job, they're less motivated to like, give you a raise because they're like you're already here like what are you going to do leave like it's it's you're a little bit more you have more power uh when you're accepting a job than when you're like trying to negotiate within a job so um I definitely recommend it I and I say this because I am someone I had never negotiated um until my first I accepted my first tech job and I wanted to throw up <laughs> when I was trying to negotiate but it like I got a little bit more money out of it and it, you know, that compounds over time and having like know your worth. I think even if you're really grateful to be getting a job, I highly recommend negotiating your salary and I'm happy to talk to y'all more. Oh, go ahead, Davina. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I would love to hear more about how you approach that because that definitely like freaks me out. Like just give me money. I don't care what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially, especially if it's going to be a big jump, it's like, so easy to be like, oh my gosh, like this is like way more than I was making before. Like, yes, just give it to me. Um, so I'm I'm happy to send y'all some resources that I have about negotiating. I think like some of the things that are helpful, one is understanding the market. And so that means, you know, if maybe geographically around where you are, maybe around the specific tech stack or the industry you're going into, um, you know, if you're working at like a startup versus a bigger company, or if you're working in like as a contractor for something, like trying to research as much as you can um, around your specific industry so that you are armed with actual numbers and like facts going into it. Um, for me, one thing that was really helpful is that I actually had a friend who had just accepted a job in a very, like the same position at a very similar company of a similar size. So I was just like, how much are you making? Uh, and I was like, perfect. Like that's like ballpark what I should be expecting. Um, so I definitely, it's so taboo, but talking about money is, is a really, really empowering thing to do. Um, so yeah, figuring out what is a fair rate and then talking to, um, 
whoever has made the offer to you of like the value that you think you're bringing um, and, you know, trying to, trying to make it like a collaborative conversation too, of like, I really am excited about this company. Um, I think I'm going to be a great fit. Clearly you think I'm going to be a great fit. Um, like, I would love to find something that works for both of us. I think like that framing of it is helpful. Um, Louis, do you have any experience with negotiating? Did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, there, I was gonna say there's some tools that you can use to find a good salary range. Like um, Glassdoor is great. And also there's a site called levels.fyi where you can compare people's salaries based on their experience. And also um, some states require that they put a job, uh, a salary range on their uh, applications or their job listings. So if you're looking at a job, like, I mean, and I don't think DC requires it, but if you look in Colorado for a similar job, you can get an idea of what kind of salary they're asking for. And that can help with your negotiation. Something that was really helpful to me um, when I was preparing to negotiate is that I had um, from my boot camp, I had a career coach who we just like role played me negotiating because uh, I was just so stressed out about it. Just having that practice conversation was really, really helpful to me. Um, so if you have someone you can practice with, do that. If you, I, I'm always happy to do that too. Um, like if you want to just like DM me like, hey, I got a, got an offer. Like, can we practice? I'm happy to do that. Feel free to message me um, because I think it's similar to job um, interviews where the more practice you get, it's still stressful, but it is a little bit more familiar and you're, you feel a little bit more confident in it. So I think with negotiation, it's, I would recommend doing the same thing and just practicing um, if you can. But yeah, I have a ton of, I, I, like I said, I hated negotiating. So I collected a bunch of resources on it. So I'm, I'll share that with you all um, after our calls, just feel free to peruse again, like all of these things I think are, um, get a lot of different opinions about it and then just kind of like distill that into what works best for you. So um, yeah, I'll share that after our call. Um, cool. All right. Well, feel free. We can, if you have um, follow-up thoughts, we can um, continue this conversation on Slack as always, but I'll go ahead and pass it back over to Lewis to talk us through the issues for this week. Okay, uh, can everyone see my screen? So for this week, um, so we're going to be doing issues 12 and 13. Um, and Andrea and Shane will be on issue 12, and Devine and Emily will be on issue 13. Unless you guys want to switch it, we can do that. But I'll show you the issues now. Okay. Let's start with 12 first. As a user, I want to be able to delete items from my shopping list uh, so that my list isn't cluttered with items that um, I don't want to buy in the future. <clears throat> so users might make mistakes when entering an item or they want they decide they don't need it anymore. So we want to be able to add a button next to the item name so that we can delete the item and remove it from our list. Um, from today's demo, it looks like we have a list with like 30 items on it now from testing, so it'd be nice to be able to clean that up. <clears throat> so for the acceptance criteria, the list item component will have a button and the button will just delete the item when clicked. Uh, we'll want to add a prompt or something to confirm deleting so that we don't accidentally delete items as well. Uh, and there's a function in the API Firebase.js file with a, a delete item function. And I think that might need to be filled out or it's already is, so just confirm that and we can use that to delete the item. Um, so the only note here is that we'll need some type of confirmation dialog. Um, you might be able to use the built-in JavaScript confirm one, or you can use uh, a, a library or anything. We can, we can, you can discuss that with your, uh, amongst yourselves later. Um, so that is issue 12. Does anyone have any questions about that one? So for issue 13, <clears throat> as a user, I want to view a list of my shopping 
list. I'm going to give you a list of my shopping list items in order of how soon I'm likely to need to buy them. Uh, so it's clear what I need to buy soon. <clears throat> so for this one, uh, we're going to be building off of what we did last week with the next purchase date. Uh, and we're going to be sorting the items by the next purchase date. Um, it'll be sorted into four groups. Um, you can sort by need to buy soon, which is seven days or less. Uh, need to buy kind of soon, which is between seven and 30 days. Uh, need to buy not soon, which is more than 30 days. And then inactive, which means it's been more than 60 days since the item has been last purchased. So to implement this, your team will need to create some UI elements uh, to kind of discern the differences between those four, four uh, states. So, and then sorting the items within those states. So for the acceptance criteria, um, the items in the list are shown with an indicator showing how soon they need to buy the item. Um, and it doesn't rely only on color for accessibility issues. You'll, you can add some text with color or you can add um, any type of other indicator. Um, the API Firebase Firestore file has a compare purchase urgency I can, that you can use to sort items. And then if you, there's also a stretch goal here. Um, so if you complete all of that, um, if you have an item where the next purchase date is in the past, uh, it would be considered overdue and you can uh, use that to um, notify a user with a UI element as well for overdue items. <clears throat> and there's some notes here as well for its sorting and also functions that you can use. Does anyone have any questions about uh, this particular issue? Cool. <clears throat> cool. So, with um, do we want to continue with uh, this um, assignment or this one, this assignment, or do you want to switch? We'll, we'll do this one as well. We'll just do this one. I was going to say, like, I know, Davina, you've worked a lot with dates and, and the timestamps over the past two weeks. So, like, if you wanted to switch, I would not be surprised if you just wanted a break from, from that. <laughs> no, I definitely looked at this and was like, oh, three hard ones in, a, in three weeks. I love it. I'm good. It's fine. It's a challenge. I'm up for it. Cool. All right. Um, so in that case, we'll we'll maintain the um, pairings as we have them. Um, one thing to note: so our self-study learning modules are going to be this week is what to ask your interviewers. Um, so we are transitioning into um, this week and I believe next week also. We're going to be talking about interviews. Um, so definitely some good one, um, some good videos to watch. Um, also, just wanted to flag that um, I know we've been talking about um, some of our like additional work that we might want to work on in the future. Um, so this week, we've got a couple of issues. Next week is going to be when we're looking at our kind of design work. And then the, the last three weeks are allocated to just like finish up whatever like whatever has come up so probably some of that will be design work um, overflow usually in the past we've given teams two weeks to work on that so just to give you a sense of it's okay if you don't finish it all in one week um, and then the, the last three weeks um, you can work on design or you can start thinking about those additional tickets that you've been talking about wanting to work on some of those edge cases and we can like allocate those um, as well it's kind of whatever the team wants to work on. So just to 
prime that idea in your mind so you can be thinking about that um, moving forward. Um, so like, for example, there was a stretch goal that Lewis talked about. If you don't get to it, I mean, if you get to it, that's awesome. If you don't get to it, we could consider incorporating that in a future week um, or something like that. Any questions? If we um if we think of good issues to add to that like last sprint, so to speak, or that last couple of weeks, um, can we just add them to the repo and just sort of like try to follow the same format that stuff is already there? Cool. Totally. Um, I would say if you're creating them, make sure you just like I, I would just like let the team know, like, hey, I created this issue so that, you know, if, if people have feedback about like, oh, maybe we can like split this into two tickets or maybe we can like add this other thing to it. Um, so just make sure like we're communicating so everyone knows. But yeah, you feel free to start uh, writing issues if you think of them. Sounds great. Anything else? All right. Happy Sunday, everyone. Uh, we will talk to you later. And we'll send those uh, resources after our call as well. So bye, y'all. Bye, thank you.